All right, well, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, we have quite a few people that are online. That's uh, about a minute after the uh, top of the hour. So we'll go ahead and get started. So I wanted to thank everyone for uh, joining this session. Uh, we're going to basically be doing a bit of an uh, intro into controls and sensors. Uh, this is a PDH course, so professional development hours for the engineers in only three of the states that we're dealing with, however. So we've got North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia set up. We are working on some of the others. So we are working on Florida. We're gonna be looking at Tennessee and Virginia as well. So apologize for not having those established as of yet, but we will definitely be working on that. So, uh, but the uh, PDH course. So what you'll see here is more of a controls discussion, uh, not manufacturer discussion. So this, in my opinion, will apply for all manufacturers. And we're going to talk about some of those things as we go through. So the other thing that we are going to be doing during this is we do have two mock co-hosts co with uh, Kirk Patton and Tony Mormino. They're going to be monitoring the chat uh, functionality of the meeting. So if there are questions, you can ask them, uh, you can share it to the group. They will answer those via chat, or they may even break in. And uh, if it's something that we need to highlight or really address more deeply at that point in time, uh, they will break in and really talk us through those. The other thing we're going to use that chat for is there obviously we think will be some questions and then we'll tailor. This is more of kind of phase one into controls and sensors and kind of that high level overview. And then we want to dig deeper, but we want to know what this group wants us to dig deeper on. So if there are very specific applications and things that we need to dig into, uh, we can monitor those chats and those questions and maybe not cover it today, but in a week or so, put something together uh, specifically or independently. Uh, we can do those because obviously we are in a looking for what our next normal is for communication after COVID. So we appreciate the opportunity to be here with you today uh, for you taking that time, as well as hope you're gonna get something out of that um, as, as we kind of go through from an understanding standpoint. So if we talk about what we're really going into, obviously this, we're Insight Partners, just kind of a quick introduction. Uh, we put in our Insight Partners, we have some core values that we deal with. We wanna talk about distinctive excellence. We want to be working together and working and uh, we're stronger. So we see this as a partnership, as a team. Uh, as we come together, we deliver better projects for everyone out there, whether it's the customers, the end users, the contractors, the engineers, everybody. Um, so we we make sure that our core value is our team is empowered to deliver to you and give you what you would like to have, as well as we want to stay invested in our people to make sure that they realize they're here to provide that distinctive excellence for you. So we are going to go through today a quick agenda, the speaker introduction. So I'll introduce myself a little bit. Uh, controls basics, control sequences, uh, the psychrometrics and sensors, and then recommended sequences by applications. So I start with a couple of different things. So just who I am, uh, my name is obviously Chris Adams. I'm a mechanical engineer degree. I'm the VP of Engineering for Insight Partners, so I do cover from the Carolinas through Florida, um, as well as our sister company, uh, which is Tennessee and Virginia with Hobbs and Associates. So I've been around for about 16 years now in the industry. I uh, was Adams Companies prior to that as a manufacturer's rep firm when we came together and formed the bigger Insight Partners with the uh, Hobbs and Associates and Texas Air, Texas Air Systems. So you can see kind of the uh, overview of who I am and what uh, kind of I'm about. Prior to that, I was with General Electric and I dealt with uh, gas turbines, steam, nuclear, a whole bunch of other things still in the uh, repair services type world. So first of all, controls basics. No matter what anybody says, all manufacturers make great equipment only when it's applied correctly. There are a lot of pieces of equipment out there that are not proper for the right application. So whether you're a sensible design or a latent design, it makes a difference. And there's too many manufacturers that are out there just trying to sell you a piece of equipment. So they'll put into a position where it's not going to work or it's not gonna work correctly. Now it may not be their own fault. It may be things like, uh, we see a lot of cases where we'll put an application together. They want 72 degrees, somewhere around 55% relative humidity. We're doing that, we're doing that great, but then somebody comes in there and say, well, we want it to run at 68. And so somebody changes the set point. That 
doesn't work. That is now a misapplied piece of equipment. Manufacturers would go out of business if they did not make great equipment. So I will start with that. So if I pick on any manufacturer, remember I'm picking on them in, this, in the guise of they probably had it somehow misapplied. The next statement, it is always control's fault. Now I hope you get the humor in that, that it's a smile, but it is always control's fault. We became a controls contractor as well, where we're controlling our own equipment. And we did that because we also know if you review the trend data and you're all, you can always identify the problem. Now controls may or may not be able to fix the issue. And one of the things my service team has taught me, it's generally always something simple, but at the end it's always, I mean, we do look at it from a control scenario. So I try and teach from the standpoint of stories every once in a while. Um, so I get called into a lot of projects to deal with the different issues of what's going on. So a recent project, I got called in to look at it and it was a chiller project. It was not working well. They kept having problems. It was tripping. There were two sides. There was a phase one and a phase two. Phase one was no problem. Phase two was a big time problem. And they were two different manufacturers. So of course we blamed the manufacturer. Well, the way I look at that is if we're blaming a manufacturer, most of the time we're admitting the equipment is smarter than us. So I don't take that date. I go and look at it. And so we just look at it and sure enough, it did turn out to be something simple. There were controls issues. There were also internal controls issues. So the equipment had a problem in its internal control scenario, but so did the external control system of what it was telling it to do. And then there were some maintenance issues. So it was actually a factor of three things all in one. And interestingly enough, it was very quickly found just by looking at the controls and the controls trends. And we fixed that, but you have to take a look. You've got to look at those controls. You've got to look at what's going on. So another aspect of controls basics. There is no such thing as a bad controller, but there are a lot of bad programmers. So we have to understand the psychometrics to optimize. So obviously you can read this art, read the uh, caption in the picture on the right. Hey, went to the store and came back with six bottles of milk because mom said, if they have eggs, bring six. Didn't bring any eggs, but brought six bottles of milk. That's exactly the controls world. It is very specific on semantics to be able to deal with that. So you have to understand what you're trying to accomplish. Now, the one thing I will say about controls is we truly make it overcomplicated. So my talk here today is really to try and see, is there a way we can make it less complicated and really discuss what's going on and back to the basics a little bit. So you may not agree with all the things I'm gonna say, but stick with me. The presentation will kind of walk you through where I came to this because we did get forced into be a controls contractor because I had third party controls that were giving me a really hard time. And so I decided I wasn't gonna put myself through that pain any longer. So again, controls can't fix a misapplied system. So let's talk about this. And so this is where this is gonna start. The control system types, there are three. There's basic, configurable, and custom. So we only have those three types of control systems that we're gonna, that basically almost, I would say, I haven't found any that doesn't fit into those three categories. And you may be surprised as we go through this where most of them fit because they're not custom. Most of them are configurable. So control contractors exist out there and they're integrating with configurable controls. Now, the other thing I'll talk about, there are three primary sequences. What are those sequences? Variable air volume, single zone VAV, and makeup air. Now you think about that and say, everybody out there is probably screaming saying, nope, there's more than that. Well, let me, again, stick with me. We'll talk through it and we'll kind of get back to why I believe there are only three. Because if you as an engineer or a contractor or an owner come to me and you tell me it's in one of those three categories, I pretty much know most of the things about your application. I'm gonna ask a couple more questions and we'll kind of talk through that and how to ask the questions to really talk about sequences. But we can really boil it down into those three. So first, system types, those three different types, you break them apart a little bit. Basic is really just that, thermostat. On-off thermostats and programmable thermostats, they have a fixed 
sequence built into that thermostat that whether it's just timers or whatever it is, what time they come off, what time they go on, all those kind of things, very, very basic. Next is the configurable. This is where I think most people kind of look at it and say, this is most manufacturers and most people don't believe that until you get into it. They have an internal black box. You can try and push it around, but you may not be able to. Most of the time, controls contractors are in integration with adjustments, doing read-write access to adjustments of set points. There are some tuning things you can do within PID loops and things like along those lines, but in the grand scheme, that's where most of the time in the commercial world spends and is the most common in our industry. But then we go to custom. And then you get the Tritium, the Allerton, the Distex. I mean, there's a whole bunch of controllers. Remember, I said there's no such thing as a bad controller, just a bad programmer. Well, when you talk about custom, we are talking about everything else. Now, I had this, I mean, when you talk about custom, if you want a custom control where you're leaving your office, you turn off the light switch in your office, and your car starts and warms up in the parking lot, with custom controls, I can do that. Now, why would you? That's a different question. So just because you can doesn't mean you should. So we have to go through that and understand. But we are basically, in some applications, full custom is where you have to spend some time. And that's where you have to know the psychrometrics. And we're going to talk why that is. So now we'll go back to the other side of that is the primary sequences. We talk about three, the variable air volume, single zone VAV, and the makeup air. Are we missing any? Well, the first one that most people tell me we're missing is a constant air volume. Well, a constant air volume is exactly the same as a single zone VAV with a constant fan speed. The sequence remains the same overall of what you're looking at. So we don't even need the constant air volume. So if I write three master sequences in those top three, I can automatically cover just about every application you're gonna look at. Now we talk about some of the other stuff dehumidification or humidification. I don't consider that a sequence. I consider that part of a sequence. I see that part of controlling an application. And so that's really what we're trying to do is understand that. And what I'm going to define that as, again, with controls, we have to be very precise about what we're talking about. So I'm going to call that a secondary sequence. And so you have your primary sequence, but then you have all the other stuff you want to do. I do want to control that operating room. I want to dehumidify it in the summer and humidify it in the winter. Great. That is in addition to that single zone VAV with constant speed fans. Pressurization also occurs in that operating room of what we're going to deal with. So we have to go through those pieces. So when you talk about primary sequences, what's really happening? By telling me the primary sequence, you've told me the mode sensor. So what are modes? What's the unit doing? Is it off? Is it venting? Heating or cooling? Those are the primary modes and that defines the sensor we have to have. So a variable air volume. We primarily look at return air temperature. We also look at, so we know our, which mode are we going to go in? They're not control sensors yet. We'll get to those. So we have to understand the mode and the decision of what's going to be, what's that unit supposed to be doing. Single zone VAV, including that constant air volume, we're looking at space temp. Makeup air unit, we're looking at outdoor air temp. Now this is again, the first phase of that. So I've only got return air temperature, space temp, and outdoor air temp. And you can actually have dual mode units where you pick two of these. So you can have a makeup air unit that's doing makeup air primarily, but then also doing that single zone VAV for space temp control. And that's really what we're going to explore more of today is how do we do those type of things as we're going through. Now, secondary sequences, that's where you really talk about it. There are a tremendous amount of secondary sequences. There's humidification and dehumidification. There's economizing, pressurization, airflow. If you want uh, lead points and you're going to get some of the control of the, um, exact amount of air you're putting in, whether there's filter loading sequences. I need to speed up my supply fans with a VFD for loading up the filters. Demand control ventilation, whether it's CO2 control, whether it's VOC control. And then you also have some other things that you could also talk about even within the safety realm with smoke evacuation sequences. So 
generator power, losing things like that, those can all be classified as that secondary sequence of what we're going through. So we go through that, let's look at some of that. And so we talk about dehumidification as a secondary sequence, but then you also have to know, I'm not getting in yet to either called a component sequence or a tertiary sequence. And that's the stuff that's internal to the unit. So as you're specifying a unit, you've got to tell us what's going on, but the unit's still going to have some of its own other additional sensors, whether they're in, in their internal unit, talking about supply fan, talking about compressors. Do we have chilled water? Are we modulating valves? How are we doing that? What are the loops associated with that? How do we want to control reheat? A lot of those different pieces. But let's continue to simplify based on the application and let's really talk about what are the next step. In the secondary sequences, we talk about the control sensors and we need to find out what are the required control sensors. And I'll say here, we only want the sensors you really need, not the ones you really want at times because what you need is what you need to control the unit and to identify problems through trending data. If you have the required control sensors, you can see all of that pretty easily right away. So we'll go through that. So let's start develop a process. The control process development is what is the application? Where are we going to start? So we're going to talk a little bit about a, a dual mode scenario. So we're going to have a classroom that we're trying to control with the makeup air as part of it. So we're doing the makeup air for that ventilation, but we automatically know, all right, so we've got a classroom, so we, and, but we have that makeup air component. And we're also, again, I'm, we are a group of folks that are in the Southeast. So we're gonna talk about that mode sensor is because of the outside air, it's outside air temp. Now, if you tell me makeup air sequence, I'm absolutely gonna tell you it's outside air temp right away because anything greater than 25% outside air, I'm actually gonna classify you as a makeup air unit. Now we can, we actually have a couple other classes, and again, those are deeper level psychrometric classes. If you have a desire for those, please let us know. We will put on those sessions as well, because I have one that I call, what, how much air classifies a unit as a high volume outside air? Well, that's why I'm starting there. Mode sensor, outside air temp. Are we a humid climate? Well, in the Southeast, the answer is yes, we are a humid climate. So I'm probably going to add a outside air humidity as well and to be able to control that moisture. If you don't wanna control the moisture, we definitely don't need a humidity sensor. So we don't have to add that. Now we're in a classroom, so we have space temperature sensing. Do we want it or not? There's a lot of people that say, no, we don't want that. We want a neutral air machine. I'm going to push back a little bit on neutral air machines, but you'll see that in the process. So, but as a space temperature sensing, add space temperature. Again, basic control theory, where should you measure the temperature? It's closest to the people that are going to complain on you. So if you are doing classrooms, we ought to measure the temperature in the classroom. Now we can look at voting and things like that. Uh, hey, which classroom is too hot? Which one's too low? but we can also reset on other things based on space temperature. What you're looking for is what's the best measure of space temperature, so is there a proxy of that? Well, if you had a return air sensor, if you had return air from this unit, the answer is yes, you've got a great sensor there because it's an average of all of the classrooms from the return air, so that's great, we can use that. Or you can pick a classroom and say, I'm gonna use that sensor, knowing that the other classroom might be a problem, but as long as we put it in the load zone that's similar to the other, we still may be okay. But then we also talk about economizing and most codes we are talking about economizing is required when you have enough airflow. And then are you gonna do any airflow monitoring? Well, I'm gonna probably say no on the airflow monitoring, but yes on the economizing is what I would do. But again, we're going back to what are the required sensors? So. I'm gonna insert a poll question here. So I'm gonna send out a poll here so that everybody can get online and check this thing out. And the application is a classroom to make up air. We've got a design space of 75 degrees at 50% RH. It's in the Southeast. We want to control moisture and it's a high school classroom. So the room is warm, 
outdoor air is raining and about 55 degrees. And the question is, should you economize? So I'm gonna turn this poll on, I'm gonna launch the poll. So on your screen, now I will go ahead and defend you, don't worry about it, this is anonymous. Nobody is going to be, I don't have a list of who is going to be here or what's going to be happening. So the question is, do we economize in a situation like that? And it can be pouring down rain, monsoon, let's talk about it. So I'm watching the votes come in. So a lot of people are voting very quickly, so let's have a little fun. So I've got 59% of the votes are in, 64% popping on through. Excellent. It's trending pretty much how I would expect. Give it another uh, 15 seconds or so of what's going on. I really thank the people that are participating here. This is great. This is wonderful. Um, so 10 more seconds, get your vote in. All right, so I'm gonna end that polling now and I'm gonna share the results. And as you share those results, you see 50%, uh, so 56 people said, no, you should not economize. 27% said, yes, you should economize. Um, the engineering answer, it depends. I always love that one. So I, I gave that one as a caveat to let some people off the hook. And the other six don't know are uh, out there, so 5%. Well, this is very, very classic of what's going on. The classic answer and response is no. And I'm gonna give you the reasons I've heard is, well, you're adding moisture to the space. Well, here's the trick. The answer is, should you economize? And it is absolutely yes, you should economize. Now that's gonna surprise a lot of people very quickly because I've asked this question, um, in a classroom setting, I get to have more fun because if you tell me yes, or if you tell me no, I get to ask why. Well, those 30 people that are uh, saying, yes, you should economize, you get off the hook because you get to I get to say you're right, but I may not know, necessarily know, are you right for the right reasons? And so here's the reason. You think about what that desired space is. It's 75 degrees at 50% RH. Well, what is that? And a dew point scenario. That's a 55 degree dew point. Well, what's 55 degrees and raining outside? Oh, it's a 55 degree dew point. Well, let's take it one step to get that aha moment of what is your cooling coil in your unit doing? What leaving air temperature are you going for? Well, you're going for 55 degrees in most cases and your coil is dripping wet. So by default, you are 55 degrees and raining on your cooling coil. So you can do that with just 55 degrees and raining outside and you're not adding any moisture. Again, go back to the dew point question. I'm not adding moisture because the dew point outside is 55 degrees, exactly what my supply would be in that regard. So therefore, I hope that's, if you get anything out of this, let's talk about dew point from going forward. Let's talk about what your cooling coil is doing and we really understand what's happening there. So 55 degrees and raining is a perfect economizing point for 75 degrees at 50% RH. It doesn't work for an operating room because an operating room, they were probably gonna want somewhere between 60 and 68 degrees and probably about a 41 degree dew point. So the question is, when do you economize if you economize in your space, when you know what the conditions you want your space to be, what is the dew point of that space, that is the temperature at which you economize. So if you want a 65 degree dew point in your space, you can economize at 65 degrees or below, it doesn't matter whether it's raining or not. So I hope that made some sense. So we'll, uh, again, if there's some questions on that, we'll uh, have a little fun with that. And so we can get dig into some deeper on those. So let me go now. So we're gonna go to the next slide. So let's talk about it from a psychrometric view. And so here's what I did as I looked at the psychrometric view and I put in the bottom left-hand corner, you see my key, dry bulb, wet bulb, relative humidity, and lo and behold, that dew point question. So we take a top view and say, all right, we got 94 degrees, 61 wet bulb, 15% RH, so it's a dew point of 40. That's actually a real condition for a space in Prescott, Arizona. We want a space, and so I've got that 75 at 50%, 75, 63, which everybody's seen, that 50% RH, 
which is that 55 degree dew point. So what do we do? We take that hot air, we run it we, in cooling. We say, all right, we know we're hot, so we gotta be in cooling. We want a neutral air machine as we're bringing this air in, so we're gonna drop that down to that 75 degrees and provide neutral air. So really all we did was turn on the compressors per side 75 degrees. One thing to show is fixed is 40 degree dew point, 40 degree dew point. The moisture content didn't change. We just got the temperature where we want. We're still very dry at 28% RH. So obviously that doesn't apply to the Southeast very much. So we get to have a little fun and say, let's really look at a real example. So what are we doing now? So let's take this hot, humid air. We've got the outside air, and it's really not that humid at 95, 75, but we have a dew point of 67 in that ASHRAE AHR design condition. So we're in cooling and dehumidification mode. If we're taking that makeup air coming in, we take that 95 degrees, 67 degree dew point, we cool it down to 55 degrees, and I'm going to say you're saturated here because remember, you're 55 degrees and raining at this point. We then warm it back up to that 75 degree neutral. So we took that 67 degree dew point, dropped it to 53, warmed it back up. It's still 53 degree dew point, but we're now supplying 75 degrees at 47% RH. So we can try and hold this 75 degrees at 50%. This is that neutral dry air machine, but we still have to get down to this point of what's going on. So, I will then have a personal opinion here. And again, obviously everybody knows that everybody has an opinion. I am of the opinion that I don't like neutral air machines because I think they waste energy. So what I look at is trying to say, well, why not look at an actual room temperature if I add that control sensor in, it's 77 degrees. I can already provide cool air because I still have to take this hot, humid air and cool it off. Get that moisture out, get it to fall out, so I'm already cold. Well, if it's 77 degrees and warm in the space, don't warm it all the way back up. Let's maybe only warm it back up to 65 degrees. So we take that outside air. We know the dew point 67. We're still in that cooling and dehum mode. We've added in that space temperature reset. So we now have more information. We can make our unit be smarter. We turn on the compressors, cool the space down to the, or cool the supply air down to the desired dew point and then reheat that supply back up to somewhere between 65, 68 degrees. Could you leave it down here at 55? Yeah, sure, you could. But then that question becomes is, is every space needing 55 degrees in full flow? And so 65, it might be a safer place to be, but I still get that cooling effect and I get a much better uh, energy profile for that space. Now the opposite can be true as well. Even on that hot day, if you have that 95 degrees, 75, it's a cooler, it's cooler in this room, so it's 72 degrees, let's say, or the average is 72, then we can have a the need for more warming effect as we're doing compressor technology. And again, you notice I'm obviously talking about DX with hot gas reheat. So we've cooled it down, gotten below the dew point because we still need to be dry. We can then warm it back up and provide that 78 degrees we actually might even be able to do a reset on this leaving coil temperature, and it might even be able to reset higher because we don't need as much dehumidification, and you could get even more energy efficiency savings. But for the purpose of today, I just basically set that coil suction temperature to say, I'm trying to get that air down to 55. Now, one of the questions that does come up every once in a while is how to measure and where do these sensors go? And so we'll talk about that and we'll talk about this sensor specifically of where it needs to be set. So same as effect though, we take that hot air, cool it off below the dew point that we want, and then we have heating and dehumidification with direct expansion, and we can still give the warm and dry air. So from a psychometric view, you're looking at it, that is the best energy solution, is we're taking the knowledge of what's going on outside and the space to make the unit do a better job of what we want it to do. Now, as in the title of this presentation, we talked about sensors. What sensors are we going to then need? So let's kind of walk through the sensors as we look at the sensors we need to pull this off. Well, the first one, we obviously need to know what's going on outside. 
So in Prescott, Arizona, we need space temp. Anywhere in the southeast, we're going to probably need space temp, and we're also going to need humidity because we need to know all of the characteristics. So I have to know two. Any two points of a piece of air, I know the rest of what's going on. I'll know, if you give me the dry bulb wet bulb, great. If you give me the dry bulb relative humidity, fine, I can deal with that. Now remember, the one thing I always say as well is on a hot, humid day, I know there's people on this call that have said this before. Oh, man, it's so hot. It's 90 degrees and 90% relative humidity. Congratulations, you're somewhere else other than the planet Earth because it doesn't exist. But it doesn't sound as cool to say, hey, it's 90 degrees and 50% RH because that's a miserable day. Because if you're 50% RH on that 90 degree day, your dew point is above 70 degrees, you're swimming in the air. So that's where it's always kind of interesting. And everybody said it. Uh, but yeah, we got to look at it. I think I might be able to put it on the planet Earth if I had a pressure cooker. I could get the 90 degrees and 90% relative humidity. Uh, the worst place I've ever found is actually in Venezuela. They have the worst conditions on the planet that I've been able to find. Um, and it's uh, 90 degrees and it's about 160, 150, 160 grains, somewhere in that range. Um, so very, very wet of what we're doing. Lots and lots of late. So sensor one, we've got that temperature and humidity. Sensor two, we've got to know what's going on down here is we have to know this coil temperature or this leaving air temperature. Now, a lot of people say, hey, I don't want to do a, a leaving coil temperature with a thermistor. Um, there's others we look at it with a suction pressure transducer. I prefer, personally prefer the suction pressure transducer because by having that suction pressure transducer, we then also can test and evaluate the quality of the refrigeration circuit on a DX. Now, if you don't have the DX, obviously you have the chilled water coil, you've got to understand. So I'm trying to get 55 degrees. Well, you know, most people try and get 55 degrees, but most chillers don't run at 55 degree chilled water. They run at 42 to 45 degree chilled water. Same thing on a suction pressure transducer. You're going to see typically an approach of between seven to 10 degrees. So with 45 degree water, you should, in theory, be able to get between 50 and 55 degrees. Same thing on a DX. If you have a DX that's running 43 to 45 degrees, you should be able to get into the low 50s for this leaving coil temperature, and it tells you what's going on. Next sensor we're going to be looking at then is supply air temperature. Now, this hopefully is going to be that aha moment. There's a lot of controls contractors out there and a lot of people are asking for supply air dew point or, or relative humidity. So they put a combination sensor with a relative humidity sensor in the supply air. My question is, what are you using it for? Why do you need it? Well, the answer is I don't need it at all. Because remember, we came down, we dropped down below the dew point, we warmed it back up, my dew point is now fixed. It's 53, 53, 53. I know what the dew point is based on how low I got the supply air temperature. So I can calculate that piece of equipment with or calculate where that point is based on the supply air temperature. And I have less chance of an additional sensor failing. Now, can you use it? The answer is yes. So you can actually troubleshoot with it and say, all right, so am I truly getting the cooling effect that I want off of the leaving temperature, leaving coil temperature? Yeah, you could but that's not generally where we're using it, but that is that trend data. Remember we started, it's always control's fault. So that's really what's going on. But I don't, I, the only one I really need is that supply air temperature. And then if I'm gonna do the space and do that reset based on the space, I also need a space temperature sensor. Again, temperature only, I've got fixed dew point. I don't have to have a space relative humidity sensor. Space relative humidity sensor, or even the supply air relative humidity sensor is an alarming point as compared to a control point. So recognize the difference is I know what I need for controllability, but then there are other sensors, which that might be that enhancement that you're looking at is what do I need for alarm? So do you need the supply humidity? No. Do you need the room humidity? No. And we've already talked about what is the proper coil suction temperature. It's probably about 10 degrees below what you're looking for. And in a startup procedure, you can actually deal with that very quickly and understand what's going on through that scenario. 
So we've answered those questions. And so the required sensors, temp and humidity outdoor, if we're in a humid climate, coil temp, supplier temp, and roof temp. Now, I talk about an optional room humidity enhancement. What could this be used for? All right, so if the humidity is high and I want to do better, I can take this temperature, this coil temperature, and lower it to try and make that coil even colder to give myself more dehumidification. Or if it's a warming effect I'm going for, raise it up. And so that relative humidity can actually use, be used to reset your coil temperature as well because you have more information. Then it does become a control sensor that you can utilize and do something with. Okay, so we've answered those questions. So now there are other sensors that we will deal with, and this is where I get into tertiary sequences, safety sensors, or better yet, component sensors. The component, and these are the ones internal to the unit, proof of flow, pressure. I don't necessarily want to run a gas heater at full blast if I have no airflow. So it'd be nice to have the proof of flow. Now it has its high temperature cutout, it has its smoke detector, it has all those things, but it's a simple sensor from a safety standpoint that can say, is it working or not? But then again, you think about it, the more sensors you add, the more things you do have to troubleshoot if there's a problem, but this is where it starts. And then discharge pressure, and let's say at the DX machine, I'm looking at discharge or head pressure for refrigerant stability. If you're doing a lot with refrigerant, because you think about what we did in that example, we took 95 degree air, dropped it 40 degrees, so it's 55, then warmed it back up with reheat. We've got this refrigerant doing backflips. So the more sensors we have there, the better stability we can get, the longer we can actually make the equipment last because we can tune it such that it doesn't spike its temperatures. You've heard fan cycling in the past versus variable speed condenser fans. Variable speed, stable refrigerant, adds to the reliability of equipment over time. So we still have to go through that. So the final piece of what we're doing is, again, this is the high level piece. We can dig into this in later presentations is what is the recommended sequence? And so you have to start by understanding the application. You cannot fix a misapplied piece of equipment. So you look at this room, you look at the piece of equipment. Am I doing outside air? What percentage? Is it a high volume outside air piece? Does it have greater, are greater uh, than 25% from an outside air uh, equipment. Do we have energy recovery? Can we take advantage of some of that exhaust? Do we have the cooling? Do we have the reheat? Are we doing it with maybe desiccant? What type of heat are we providing? All of these go into that space application so that we know, is it a latent or sensible design? And I'm gonna stop there. The number one misapplied piece of equipment is a sensible piece of equipment for a latent application. We see that more than anything else. There are specifics to a latent piece of equipment that has the ability to deal with large temperature differences and moisture control. So they talk about it in uh, some of the classes, track the heat, track the moisture, know where it's coming from. Is the moisture coming from permeation, perspiration, like a workout or a spin room? These permeation infiltrate are low dew point, are they operating rooms? Evaporation, indoor pools, cleaning and sterilizing. We actually had a customer problem one time on a unit that they said, we keep seeing a spike in humidity. Well, they basically went in and were sterilizing the procedure room between every procedure and dumping a five gallon bucket of sterilizing essentially, because they're mopping the floors, cleaning every surface, and we're wondering why we were seeing such a spike. Well, we can design for that, but most of the time you design is, there's going to be a spike and how long do you recover? So you have to plan for that. Product drying, do we really have to be dry? And then the outside air is the makeup or ventilation. If any of these moisture loads are high, you're probably looking at a latent design piece of equipment. So the best way I can go through these is looking at applications and examples. Let's start with a church as one. A church would be best served, again, my opinion, a single zone VAV with moisture control. It's low load most of the time, so your units are extremely oversized. And we all talk about that, you hear about that in residences, is if your unit's oversized, you're gonna have a moisture problem. Absolutely. So you have to have something to deal with that moisture control in that unit being oversized. You're gonna see that quick spike in load due to occupants, 
and you need high outside air, again, defined as greater than 25%. So you have to be able to deal with that and you have to deal with that quickly. A single zone VAV says, I'm going to take advantage of unloading or limiting the oversizing of the equipment, but I'm still probably going to need some way to control that moisture, whether it's a reheat sequence, whether it's an ERV sequence added to it. Now, ERV sequence does not control moisture on its own. All it does is delay when it's going to impact the space. So if it's outside air and raining in 75 degrees, long periods of time, eventually it's gonna be, that moisture is gonna find its way in through an ERV. But instead of five minutes on 100% outside air machine, it may take 30 minutes through an ERV. Those are the type of things to think about. So the other scenario that I have seen as a solution for this, this is why I do like HVAC is, there's 10 different solutions for every problem. This is my preferred method, but let's say you had two 25 ton units. Well, you have multiple stages, so you essentially have four 12 and a half ton compressors, thereabouts, in most manufacturers. Well, then it says, all right, so I'm anticipating that space is gonna be 12 and a half tons. Well, if it's unoccupied and it's a church, it's probably not even 12 tons, it might be five. So let's say you could add another five ton unit that runs for the unoccupied control that way that unit runs all the time, deals with the moisture, it's another way. It's not a guaranteed way, but it's a passive way to control the moisture in that space. And it is very effective to load up one unit to get out enough moisture. Next one, classroom, single zone VAV plus makeup air. Now this again, my personal preference, I like to isolate the sensible versus the latent. I like dedicated outside air units because they have a steady load. They're not generally at peak because we're not in school from the summertime, most places. So that dedicated outside air with ERV gives you a great energy point and it has built-in redundancy because what happens if your sensor machines all die? We have an outside air machine that's blowing in cold. And well, if you had an outside air blowing in neutral air, that's one thing, but let's say we then modify that unit very quickly through the controls let it provide all the cooling it possibly can, you do have some built-in redundancy, the, and you recirculate. That's when you have that ERV, you can recirculate, and then you're providing cool air. Are you meeting the code for outside air? No, but you've got stuff that's broken. What's the danger? Well, I'm gonna have high CO2 levels for a period of time. So the teachers are the ones that are gonna be at the most risk of students falling asleep. But if we deal with it and say, we got a couple of days, we can keep the, the classroom reasonably in check. You're not gonna keep it at 75 degrees and 50%, but let's say you keep it at 78. You don't have to shut down and we're still comfortable. Now, I don't remember having cooling and air conditioning in the school growing up. So we're still dealing with that in a very different way that now if we lose it in a school, we close school. We never did when probably most of us on this call were dealing with that. Two other applications, operating rooms or pharmacies. I still like the single zone VAV, which is, this is gonna be a fixed fan speed single zone VAV because you have that pressure control. So adjusting your supply fan is very, very tricky. So it's probably gonna be constant speed with the pressure control by the rooms. And you're gonna be low temperature, low dew point, high air change rates. A um, little word of knowledge here, the internal loads can exceed expectations. Some of the uh, HEPA filter um, grills that come through that are fan powered, they give off a lot more load, I think, than we give them credit for. So we've actually had some scenarios where it did exceed expectations and you have very tight tolerance. So you're going to have to then, in this application, lean towards true custom, because that's where this is going to be, is that very sophisticated application. And then we can even talk about indoor pools. Still a single zone VAV with the moisture control, absolutely using adjustable fans as necessary, because if it's occupied, we still need fresh air, but we don't need all the load as much. And that's, the, you think about why do we use VAVs to begin with? To try and maximize moisture removal and only provide the cooling necessary for a specific room. I'm not a huge fan of VAV because I see too many with the supply reheat with electric strip. So all that savings we just did on the VAV if it doesn't match the load characteristics, then we do start to lose the efficiency that we gain by using electric strip reading. Again, personal opinions, but the indoor pool application, it's all latent, it's higher temperatures with higher dew points, it's 24 seven operation. Now, if we think about this one further on this indoor pool, what is the indoor design dew point? Well, you're 84 degrees, 
and probably 66 to 68 degree dew point. So let's go back to our poll question. When should I economize or should I economize on a pool? We can absolutely economize on a pool based on that dew point question and 66 degrees and raining outside is actually giving you the capability to dehumidify an indoor pool environment because it's a dew point question of what's going on. So finally, what is the recommended sequence and all the way I go through, here's all the ones where the churches, the classrooms are, we did that, we did, like we talk about hotel hallways, 75 degrees, they definitely want warmer in the hallways, they want a 58 degree dew point. They're basically in the nicest way possible telling you, go to your room. They don't want you in the hallway, they want you in your room where you have independent control. There's that indoor pool, it's a 66 degree dew point. We have some applications coming up, the grow houses. It changes, 75 to 78 degrees, 50 to 55%, it depends. We have fitness areas, single zone VAV, heavy load when they're occupied, no load when they're not, plus the makeup air component. So this would be a spin room where you have tremendous amounts of CO2 being generated. So they range from 68 to 72 at 55%. They're gonna look at those lower dew points that they want to be more comfortable and then locker rooms there, makeup air, unit 72, 55%, 55 degree dew point. So the summary, three sequences. These are the primary sequences, VAV, single zone VAV and makeup air. I hope I've made my point there. There are only three control types then you have to decide from, which is the basic, the configurable, or are you gonna have to go full custom, knowing that our industry is configurable. Finally, secondary sequences. Dehumidification, humidification, flow control, and the sky's the limit here. If I'm asking, if an engineer wants to define, I need a sequence of operation, tell me one of the three, and then tell me what you want to do with the space, because that's the next thing. So my final thought, custom controls allow for that flexibility and tuning. Some things get very unique in what you're trying to accomplish in some of these spaces, but do not overcomplicate it. You think about the sensors that I was putting in there. Only a few sensors are really required. So only put the essential sensors and know the difference. Are they mode control or control sensors? So are, are they controlling the mode of the unit? Are they truly controlling what the unit is doing? Because they're two different pieces. Now the last piece, and this is the, for all the contractors out there, first step in troubleshooting. Are your sensors reading reasonably? Review the trends, it's always control's fault. 80% of your issues will be defined by checking out. Is the supply air temperature, this unit is in cooling, and it shows me the supply air temperature is at 75 degrees. It's probably not reading reasonably unless I'm running reheat. If I'm not running reheat, and I've confirmed that, if I'm not closer to 50 to 5 to 60, something's mechanically wrong, I now know what it is, or the sensor's just bad. So make sure you run through that. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Uh, obviously, we do have the list of folks that have attended this session. We're gonna open it up if there's some chats or discussions there. Um, but for the PDH credits, um, we will have that. Uh, if you'll send us an email, we will send you that certificate back. Um, again, we have the list of the emails, so what they need to know who, is, who are the PEs out there and who needs those certificates of attendance, and we'll get those out there. So with that, um, Kirk, Tony, anything else to add? Anything from the chat, any discussion um, that we need to go on from here? Uh, thanks, Chris, that was great, very informative. I, I have a question. Uh, okay. Maybe you could touch on this a little bit. When, you, when we're looking at low dew point applications like the OR suites, surgical suites, stuff like that, where do you put the cutoff for DX equipment versus like when you would start looking at an active desiccant product? I usually, I'm in the high 40s is kind of where I start looking at different options, but I was out of the loop for about a year, so I don't know if new technologies have changed, so update me or give me your opinion on that. Okay, so I have a very specific rule of, of, that I go with, and it's actually through experience that we've developed. So when I'm looking at a low dew point application, so what I say is anything above 55 degrees, any manufacturer can pull off. If I'm going between 55 degrees down to 42 degrees. So 42 degrees is the cutoff that I say, I'm going to need something special. 
I'm going to need a special piece of equipment on the DX side that is truly a latent design machine to get down to 42 degrees. What have I gotten down to with DX? 38. There's a problem with 38, however, is you better be talking about custom controls because there's this weird thing that happens with water at 32. It kind of turns into icebergs, and so you have to be very, very cautious of what's going on. Now you also, that 42 degrees, where did that come from? Think about where I talked about when I looked at coil temperatures and the suction temperature on a coil. What is the approach? Seven to 10 degrees. 10 degrees below 42 is when that magical ice starts to form. So as long as I'm staying away from that approach of the 42 degree or that 32 degrees, if I set a coil temperature at 32, fine, I'm probably not going to freeze a coil. Most manufacturers look at about 35 degrees as their cutoff. We've run down to about 28, but you have to monitor it carefully to make sure that you do not form ice on your coil. So 42 degrees for DX going below that, we're gonna start looking at desiccant applications to get even lower. And how low can you go with desiccant? Um, the lowest I've ever actually personally been involved in was at minus 71 degree dew point. So that's a lot dry. So I kind of figure out that's pharmaceutical freezers and applications of that type. Great question. All right, thanks, Chris. Any other questions in the chat out there or anybody, you, you can take yourself off mute and ask a question if you'd like. Um, Sarah wants to know if they're gonna receive a email with a link to this recording. And I think the answer is yes. Yep, that will be the plan. So Tony, you can uh, help me with that. Be glad to. It'll be on our resources page. We'll actually get it onto Insight USA resources page so that there will actually be, you'll be able to find it if you log, go. I mean, it'll be a day or two, but we'll get that recording up there. Yeah, and Sarah, just reach out to your rep and uh, we'll give you that <clears throat> to the resources page. Insight Partners, our insightusa.com is our website and there's a resources page on there which has our previous webinars and we'll have this webinar. I know it's large meetings are very difficult to ask questions in. So yeah, we had a lot of people that joined us. So we really do thank you for that. Um, if there are any other questions um, either in the chat or if you actually want to uh, send them to us an email, we can actually answer that as well. Uh, Steve has a question. Will PDFs be learned if the recording is watched later? I think that requires a, it depends answer. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I was, we were working on that one as well. And the answer we have to figure out is how do we track, because from a PDH standpoint, in uh, North Carolina, probably, even though it, because the interesting thing is an engineer, a PE is responsible for their own training. And if they deem it to be applicable for PDH, they can claim it. However, it's much more difficult in the audit phase if they uh, state audits you on what's going on there. So. You just have to be careful of what's going on in that regard. Um, so the PDH, all PEs are responsible. I am responsible for my own PDHs. Yes, I get to claim this as a PDH credit for me because I actually will, will be offering the one hour presentation, the one hour PDH credit. Uh, for me, I get to claim two because you get the prep time as well as the presentation time. So uh, if you present a lot, it actually makes uh, PE points easy to get. Uh, so I've never had a problem getting the required 15 I have in North Carolina. Florida, was, we're coming up, we're going to get there. Um, we will be offering those in the future, and I think Florida requires nine, but every state has different rules. Um, so each PE is responsible for that. But we will offer the certificates for sure, as we are certified for North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. Okay, I don't see any other chats coming in. So again, thank you so much for your attention. Uh, we will be offering some more of these in the future um, and we will just kind of keep digging in. So this was kind of the first phase of that controls and then we'll start digging in a lot deeper into, all right, how do you control a compressor sequence? What defines that outside air? And if you have any requests for specific topics that we'd like us to train, you can also email those requests to us. So again, thank you and you have a, everybody have a wonderful afternoon.